Is it finally time to start taking Intel graphics seriously? I've spent the last week with the Intel Arc B580 to see if Battle Mage is the silver bullet that the budget market has been waiting for or if we're just paying to be Intel's beta testers. The B580 landed at the end of 2024 with one simple job, to make Nvidia and AMD look greedy. Launching at 249 US dollars, it was clearly aimed right at the RTX 4060 and the RX 7600. Now the real history of the B580 is actually about Intel's redemption arc. Their first gen Alchemist cards were honestly an absolute mess at launch, but they've spent the last couple of years aggressively patching their drivers into something actually usable. The B580 is the first real test of their second gen architecture, and the hype was all about whether Intel could finally deliver a plug and play experience. A quick specs rundown, this card is packing 12 gigs of GDDR6 on a 192 bit bus, 20 XE2 cores, and it clocks in around 2.67 gigahertz. Now that 12 gigs of VRAM is the big talking point here. It's 50% more than what you'll find on the RTX 5060, which is a massive deal for anyone who's looking to push actual textures in 2026. Now feature-wise, we're mostly looking at XESS2. It's Intel's answer to DLSS, and honestly, it's pretty impressive. But just remember that XESS support is still a bit, you know, hit or miss compared to Nvidia's ecosystem. In terms of raw power, the B580 is marketed as a 1440p contender. That's a bold claim for a $250 MSRP, it's built to thrive where those 8 gig competitor cards start to choke. If you're a content creator, you also get those dual AV1 encoders, which makes this a very interesting value pick for more than just gaming. Now when the card first came out a year ago, it was lauded as a pretty good competitor at the price range. But that was the issue actually. Intel seemingly only made a few of these cards because it was basically impossible to find the card at MSRP. For the past 10 months, this card was usually going for more like $300, a considerable jump over the suggested price. And it's the main reason why I haven't made a video on it yet. But in the last month or two, I have finally been seeing the card at MSRP, or even a few dollars below it really, with free games included, and in pretty readily supply too. So I thought maybe it's finally time to see if this card is worth all the hype. But there are obviously some caveats too. While the drivers are way better than they used to be, Intel overhead is still a thing. In some older DX11 or DX9 titles, or if you're pairing this with an older CPU, you might see the card underperform compared to a similarly priced AMD card. So the plan for today is simple. We're going to see if that 12 gigs of VRAM actually gives us the 1440p ultra experience Intel promises. I'm testing this at native 1080p and 1440p, so you can assume that if I turned on XESS or FSR, the numbers would be slightly higher in line with upscaling numbers. The test bench today is a mid-range setup, because let's be real, you aren't pairing a $250 GPU with an i9 or a 9800X3D. So if there are any games that are heavily CPU bottlenecked, like Valorant or Fortnite, you can assume you'll get better numbers than the ones in this video. Let's get started. First game up is the benchmark I love doing, which is Cyberpunk 2077. It's a great middle ground and was once the gold standard for ray tracing and high-end rigs. But even five years later, it's still super relevant. At 1080p with all the settings to high and ray tracing turned off, we averaged 108 FPS with 1% lows of 74. A really great showing, especially in a single player game. So we can get some pretty high frame rates and keep the settings to high. But if we swap it to 1440p, but keep those same settings, we drop down to averages of 76 FPS and 1% lows of 62. And honestly, this is how I would play the game. For single player games, I really appreciate having a much higher resolution so I can enjoy all the great details in the game. And as long as that 1% lows are around 60 FPS, then I'm happy. A great start to this budget graphics card. Moving on to Battlefield 6, which is a brand new shooter that looks absolutely amazing. Now it's no secret that a lot of these fast paced esports games are going to rely heavily on CPU. And we see that our CPU and GPU are both blasting at 100%, not a single ounce of hardware being left on the table. So in this instance, we would probably get more frames if we had a better CPU that could handle this overhead. But even with that, we still got some pretty good results. At 1080p with all settings to high, we averaged 81 FPS with 1% lows of 56. Pretty great considering this game just came out and has some pretty intense graphics. And going up to 1440p but bringing those settings down to medium, we got an average of 67 with lows of 50. So more of a single player experience numbers but still could be totally fine for people who aren't hyper sweaty. I'd have no problem playing this game at either 1080p or 1440 on this card. Next game is Doom Dark Ages, which is less than a year old and is famously difficult to run on even high-end cards. 
this is one of those modern games where they kind of expect you to use some kind of upscaling like DLSS or FSR. So just keep that in mind when looking at these native numbers. At 1080p with all the settings to high, we average 63 FPS with 1% lows of 46. So not that great, but I'd say it's totally playable. And you can obviously back down the settings if you would want some better frames. But if you want better resolution, you're gonna have to really back those settings down just to get something I'd consider playable. 1440p, all settings to low, I was only able to average 50 FPS with 1% lows of 35. So not the greatest experience, but I guess for someone who is desperate or low maintenance, it could be no issue. My recommendation is to play this game with upscaling turned on to have a good experience. It's kind of sad that that's where we are at in modern gaming hardware, but it is what it is. Okay, I don't care that this game is like seven years old at this point. I still think it looks amazing. So let's test out Red Dead Redemption 2. It's a bit older for sure though, so we are going to crank the settings to ultra to see just how far we can go. And at 1080p, running the standard benchmark, I was able to average 96 FPS with 1% lows of 55. Really pretty good performance, especially considering ultra settings is kind of a meme at this point. And on the same settings, on the higher resolution, it was still 88 average and lows of 50. So there's a ton of wiggle room here if you want higher resolution or even higher frame rate gameplay. You'll be good to go even without any kind of upscaling. Okay, this game came out like a month ago, so I'm really excited to give it a test. Arc Raiders is not known for having top of the line end game graphics, but the game does look great and runs well on older hardware. I guess I would call it an esports type title as it does rely a little more on CPU than your average game. But at 1080p with all the settings to high and lighting set to static, I was able to average 103 FPS with 1% lows of 64. So not super duper high frame rates, but the game still looks awesome. And for me personally, I think any FPS over 100 is going to be a great experience for multiplayer shooters. But if you want to maintain those frames at 1440p, you'll have to drop the settings down to medium, where you will average 102 FPS and lows of 55. Still pretty awesome, and it might be how I would play this game since it's like 99% walking and looting and only a few seconds of combat. You don't need 300 FPS for that. Sorry, not sorry. Moving on to racing, we have F1 2024. A very high paced game where having a huge frame rate can be the deciding factor in the win or not. I cranked all the settings to high and let the normal benchmark rip and it did not disappoint. At 1080p I was able to get an average of 215 FPS and 1% 1 lows of 163. Absolutely insane numbers and is really going to help out budget racers reach their full potential. But if you're more into the visuals, crank that resolution to 1440p with the same high settings and expect 164 FPS averages and lows of 133. Still insane numbers, and since I'm not a hyper sweaty track star, this is how I would play the game. It looks great and still has insane frames. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is, unfortunately, another game where they kind of expect you to run it using resolution scaling. But all of our tests are native, so we will do what we can. At 1080p and all the settings to medium, we only got 64 FPS with the lows at 38. So really, really playable, even with the slightly lower minimums, but it's not really what you'd expect from a gaming PC, you know? But if you want 1440p, you'll have to drop the settings to low and you'll get very similar frames, 67 and 34 respectively. So both resolutions are reasonable playing experiences, but it's a little too similar to console performance for me to get excited about. This might be the game's fault, or it might just be the Intel drivers not performing as good as they should be, but there it is. Another heavily CPU bound game is the finals, seeing as our test had the CPU hovering around 98%. So once again, if you have a better CPU than the one in our bench test, you can expect higher numbers on these. I cranked all those settings to epic, kept the lighting on static, and jumped into a power shift game. Riding on the platform with my flamethrower, I averaged 86 FPS with 1% lows of 60. Not bad considering we're on a meme epic settings, but I was really trying to put as much of the load on the graphics card as I could. At 1440p, you'll have to drop the settings to high, and you can still expect 92 FPS averages and a low of 68. But if you're a super competitive esports gamer, I do recommend getting a better CPU. But for everyone else, this is more than enough. Okay, I did way too many games. We need to hurry this along. God of War Ragnarok is a fairly new PlayStation port, but it's surprisingly optimized for all hardware. I put it at 1080p and I set the graphics to ultra, and I was able to get 92 FPS average with some good lows. Really fantastic performance for a game this new, and a GPU this cheap. And 1440p was also a good showing once you get off, you know, the meme ultra settings. The high settings at the larger resolution was able to average 109 FPS and lows of 60. 
the perfect way to play this single player game in my opinion. Well done Intel. Hitman World of Assassination benchmark is a little older, but I still love it. I set it to 1080p with ultra settings across the board and still averaged 144 FPS with awesome 1% lows. You'll never need that many frames in this game, but hey, it's there. Up it to 1440p and back off the settings a bit, and you'll still get an average of 134 and lows of 97. This is the better way to play this game, and I might even crank it to ultra. The Intel card is doing a fantastic job on this awesome game. Okay, on to more modern games that demand upscaling, but obviously these tests are done natively. Indiana Jones looks great, don't get me wrong, but it runs horribly on any card that isn't NVIDIA, and not even that good on NVIDIA. Resolution set to 1080p with all the settings to high, and we were only able to get 74 FPS with respectable 1% lows. So yeah, it's totally playable, but come on, this is a walking simulator game. We should be able to do better than this without upscaling. If you want 1440p, you'll have to bring those settings down to medium so you can even come close to a 60 FPS experience. If I refuse to use upscaling in my own personal gaming, I think the game still looks good and runs well, and you don't really need 200 FPS in this game. Trust me. Well, frankly, you don't need the game at all. There, I said it. Resident Evil 4 Remake is a good example of a Capcom game that is actually super well optimized, and still looks pretty great. I set the settings to high at 1080p resolution and got some impressive numbers. 124 average with the lows at 91. And you're gonna want those frames when you're running from zombies, trust me. The game looks and plays awesome, but I'd probably prefer it at 1440p with the same settings. We lose some frames, coming down to 85 average and 1% lows at 72, but the game looks that much better and it's way more immersive, which I feel is what you're going for in this game. So Capcom, you're capable of optimizing. Keep doing it. Spider-Man 2 is another awesome PlayStation port, although a bit harder to run than God of War. But that's probably because the world is much bigger and you traverse it much quicker than walking simulator of war. Nevertheless, I put it at 1080p and put the settings to a happy medium, I was able to get 93 FPS with lows of 48. So while that average is great, the lows are a little bit lower than I expected. This could be due to our processor, but either way, you'll have to tweak the settings to get it to somewhere comfortable. At 1440p with the settings to low, our average dropped down to 88, but our lows did increase to 55. So this is actually a way better and more importantly, a stable experience. You're not going to get any jarring frame drops or stutters, so not a bad showing for the Spider-Mans. And last on our list is the newish Space Marine 2, a fantastic looking game that also relies heavily on upscaling, but as usual, we will push on and do our best. 1080p, high settings, and I was able to get a solid 60 FPS with the lows of 52. A playable and stable frame rate for sure, you love to see it. You're gonna have to drop those settings to low if you want to try to hit 1440p though, but you'll still get similar numbers at 62 FPS and lows of 50. So it's just a trade-off on what you value most, textures versus resolution. But that's the beauty of PC gaming, isn't it? You get to make that choice on every game you play and get the best experience you can afford. So is this card a 1440p ultra killer? No, I don't really think so. But it's an amazing 1080p card and it punches way above its weight class in 1440p. I'd say this is a great card if you want to play newer games at 1440p 60fps or want multiplayer games at 1080p with an elevated frame rate. I'm even surprised we're able to play anything at 1440p well considering the price range. Can't do that on the RTX 5060. So if you're interested in picking up this card, I'll have some links in the video description. Thanks to all the new channel members and hit the join button below if you want your name mentioned at the end of every video or just get subscribed for more technology content. I'm really trying to hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so if you could help me get that goal, I would really appreciate it. My name's Jason. Thanks for watching.